She's been awarded several prizes, including the Small Axe Literary Award, two Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Prizes, the Atlantic Monthly Student Poetry Prize, and an International Publication Prize from the Atlanta Review. Robert Frost was quoted as saying, poetry is a way of taking life by the throat. And that's what we've come to expect from Lauren's work. Poetry that, poetry that is sometimes breathy and expectant, sometimes full-voiced and resonant. But at all times, poetry that draws us more deeply into our experience as human beings. And so we celebrate with you tonight and uh, welcome to the podium, Lauren. Thank you, that was a really wonderful email. I asked uh, Dr. Ward to introduce me because four years ago, um, when we were inaugurating the potent residence as a, as a thing, and um, I was starting here at UD, he was the one who, and I remember he, he did this, uh, he said, the embodiment of poetry, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> That's, that's, that's a big responsibility, but as all of you who've ever had a conversation with me know, I am a poet first. Um, words matter to me in a very special way, and um, as Adrian Rich says, you know, if you're susceptible to, to language, um, it's important that you put it back out. And so, as someone who is, you know, lots of studying of literature, that's been really important to me, and I was I'm doing a lot of traveling for this book. Starting next week, I'm going to be in Seattle, Chicago, New York, Trinidad, everywhere. But I really, really, really wanted to do the first reading here at UD because um, I felt so supported. I feel so really welcome here and that I've been able to thrive as a writer. So thank you guys for that. Um, by the throat, so I feel completely OK with everything that comes next. <laughs> um, I get asked a lot, like, why I write or what I think about, you know, um, when I start writing, and for me it's really a way of thinking about self, of course, but also one's relationship to the world. Um, and you know, I had to come up with the elevator speech about the book for the publisher, um, and I, I've come up with, it's about a woman who's making her way in the world and making the world as she makes her way, right? Thinking about that relationship between the bigger and the inside. So this first poem I'm gonna read, it's, a little cryptic, but it's sort of asking about that relationship to, to the big thing, right? As a, as a person, as one small self. If sky. Wish for a working machine and you're given a body. Ask for options and you get a life with no roadmap and free will. Say, give me a reason and what you get is silence or wars, continents too far away to care without exertion. If you say yes to knowing, dispossession flowers in you and cleaves to your progeny for centuries. If you wish to forget, there are pills with mild side effects, dreams that grab you by the throat and pockets of fear that separate you from your skin. If you sing hymns, the gods of memory might waken and strike you with elegies for your unguarded heart. Ask for love, and the sky will unveil itself, layer by layer, its naked blue flame wanting only your blindness in return. Um, so thinking about what one can do in the face of the big thing, right? Ask the question and there isn't really an answer. It's just sort of a figure it out as you go. One of the big things that's been circulating in the last couple of years um, was the Trayvon Martin case. And again, as someone who pays attention to language but also to symbol and imagery, the hoodie, right, was something that kept popping up again and again as uh, symbolic on multiple sides of the, of the situation. And so um, this poem, in this poem rather, the, the hoodie stands witness. It speaks um, a little bit about the person who is wearing it and what that experience may or may not have been like. The hoodie stands witness for Trayvon Martin. I was built for bodies like his between boy and man, sauntering in angles he couldn't hold but swung his limbs from, careful cool in every step. I can tell you the story of him, unexceptional, 
He put change and candy into my pockets, the necessary jangle of cell phones and keys hushed in the sock of me. I watched him from the soft pile he made of me on the floor of his messy adolescent room where I lay beside his sneakers and backpack. He did his homework with chat windows open. White headphones hooked him into some steady beat. That day, he was thinking of nothing in particular. He was quiet in his skin, tucked into the shade of me. He was an easy embrace until an old ancestral fear lay its white shadow across us like an omen. I can tell you the, his many hairs raised in warning beneath me. His armpits funked me up with terror. His saunter slipped into a child's unsteady totter under the weight of a history staggering behind him mad with its own power. He clung to me then, wholly unmanned, a baby clutching his blankie. He pulled me close and I stroked his head, caressed the naps he had brushed the waves that morning. I felt him brace his bones beneath me, his heart a thousand beating drums. The bullet ripped through us like a bolt of metal lightning. His blood, losing its purpose, ran into me, and I wished we were truly a single body, that I could have held its rush and flow like a second sweaty skin. I can tell you how his spirit slipped out, like steam from cooling water, slowly, fading by degrees, until he stilled. Um, so in upstate New York, where I lived for before I came here, there's a chain of stores. Hive, uh, Hive here. Wegmans is there. Um, anybody know Wegmans? Weg Wegmans, right? Okay, just saying Wegmans. Um, and so again, I'm listening to the radio, going to the going to the grocery store in the middle of the night, which is when I like to grocery shop. And um, there's a this is a few years ago, and the riots in Haiti are happening around food, and of course, again, cell phone. I'm going to the grocery store, and there's that happening. So I shut off the car, went into the grocery shop, and then came home and started this poem, which has an epigraph, uh, which is the Grace Before Meals, which is also the title of the poem. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are going to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. As a child, I'd refuse to eat my veggies, pushing them round and round my plate until my mother's glare unclamped my jaw and I choked down every last leaf. Think, she'd say, of the starving children. Ethiopia was big then, the television haunting us with its images of thin limbs and distended bellies, flies wringing the faces of people too tired to brush them off. How I'd wished I could slip the greens, those healthy abominations, into the screen. Imagine the surprise of some little boy when he saw my hand reaching down from his sky, passing the carrots and okra like mana. In today's news, another riot. In Haiti this time, bands of people storm Port-au-Prince, fearless with hunger, while peacekeeping troops place their guns and bodies between the mob and the giant containers of food stockpiled in the city. I'm on my way to Wegmans. It's Monday night, and the parking lot is almost empty. I pull my cart from the long train, discard the one with the squeaky wheel. It's eerie, wandering alone in the fluorescent glow to Bon Jovi and the night manager's pen clicking against his clipboard. I walk right past the sprinkled produce, wheel through the aisles of fresh and frozen meat, blocks of cheese waiting to be cut, the 20 different types of cereal, high fiber, all natural, calcium enriched, and for a second, it is a bad dream. I'm in a labyrinth I must eat my way out of, the ghosts of all the world's hungry up in the bleachers watching, bony hands under their chins, and the flies, again the flies. I roam the shelves, read their bright tags, pick up or leave the cans and jars, the boxes that read a complete meal in 10 minutes, stock up to satisfy next week's hunger. At checkout, the sleepy cashier offers paper or plastic, piles bag after bag, and I pay with nothing but my name. It's okay because it's gloomy outside too, right? 
Um, I'm going to read two. Um, so there are a lot of letters in this book. Um, that didn't happen on purpose, but um, once I got started, I, I, when I was putting the manuscript together, it's like, wow, I, I like the epistolatory poem, apparently. And this one, I used to, when I was at Cornell, I taught at a girls' detention center. I taught poetry there for a while, and it was a very, very enlightening experience. Um, and this, will, this poem is to Autumn, one of the girls, um, and the title is, Dear Autumn, this poem, Too Late, Remembers You. You're the new girl, body turned away from the circle, foot scuffing the floor. You don't want to belong, and who can blame you? They're a ragged bunch, the girls at the center, sullen, spaced out, or screaming in the corners until the uniforms come to shake the sound out or muffle it with the rattle of pills. But for an hour each week, I come with my handouts and books. We huddle over hazals, sonnets, haiku, then tensed over your pencils, you're supposed to find your own words. I'm here, you write, because they want me to tell them what he did. But I'm not reading this yet. I'm just watching how your face seems so young and so weary, your eyes between flicker and fade as you scribble into the notebook you won't be allowed to keep. I think poetry can save you, but you're not interested in poems. Your re reality demands answers. It's true, he touched me, but I don't want him to go to jail. He's a good person, he just needs help. Miss Lauren, you write, what should I do? Your careful penmanship loops and curves across the page, its literal plea defying the break of stanzas, meter, or line. Home at my desk, I discard note after futile note. Dear Autumn, you are brave and beautiful. Dear Autumn, no one deserves. The world is unjust, dear Autumn, but have faith. Dear Autumn, this poem. Dear Autumn, I never get it right. So, OK, now we're going to have some fun letters. John Rambo, we know who that is? OK, good. Not too dated. <laughs> Um, this actually happened at a residency I was in Wyoming, and this is the downside of being a poet, right? There's visual artist, screen printer, photographer, and we all decided we were going to give each other a present when we were leaving. And so, you know, I get a painting, I get a print, I'm like, you get a poem, <laughs> you know. Um, but there are seven parts and sort of pulling from the personalities of each of those people, because one of the things the boys made us do was watch Rambo 5. Right. Um, letters to John Rambo. One. Dear Rambo, after all these years, you are back. The muscles on your forearm bulging as ever, the asymmetry of your face, its trademark scowl, the rusty grate of your voice reminding us you're a man who understands words don't matter if you speak kick ass. Two. Dear Rambo, You've seen it all. The way the body empties like an ice tray. The bullets kiss so clean it could break your heart. The crimson fountain a wound makes, wondrous in its puncture and spurt. Beautiful, wouldn't you say? Three. Dear Rambo, you've pushed your own body past the recognizable limits. The machine of your fist and eye sleek and practiced, ready to fire on command. I know a man who died from cellular mutiny, the cancer conquering organ after organ until every cell turned renegade, ignored the ceasefire he cried out in his sleep. You must never worry about such things. Four, dear Rambo, if I ever paint you, it would be clay on canvas. I'd put a fence in the center right where your heart would be. I'd sketch your face and cover it with sand You'd be invisible. I bet you'd like that. I'd add something to your portrait every couple of years, so rest assured, there will always be a sequel. Five, dear Rambo, I am so jealous of your metabolism. I bet you never have to count calories and can drink as much whiskey as you want. Six, dear Rambo, the last time I saw you, I must have been 10. 
You were hot then, but now my heart is well behaved and does not even twitch at the sight of you. I assume this means one of us has grown too old. <laughs> Seven, dear John, we've known each other our whole lives. I know nothing phases you. Tomorrow, I will be 29. And frankly, John, I'm scared. Tell me, what is the secret of fearlessness? So the other thing that I started doing was writing letters to myself. And if that sounds crazy, oh well. No. <laughs> um, so this actually, it's a funny story how the, the letters to myself at different ages um, started. Literally, I was moving something and my first communion photo album fell on my head. I mean, could you ask in Newton Apple? album head, it just seemed, so I, I took it with me to a writing residency in upstate New York, um, to Yaddo, and again, trying to think about, people ask, how do you write? I couldn't think of anything, and then I saw it, and I was just like, I'm gonna write from a photo. And so this is, and it, it began a whole series, not all of them made it into this book, but um, this is seven, which is, um, which is from that first, that first photo. Seven. In this picture, your dress is burning white. Your veil engulfs your head like lacy flames. Your Snoopy watch flares red on your wrist. You clutch your white handbag like a wish. Little Christ bride, you are innocence embodied down to your white knee socks, Mary Jane's and unpierced ears. Your parents are stiff with pride, their afros not yet streaked white with worry. Behind you, your godmothers hold fast to their vows and your shoulders. Nanny George, alive and beaming. Auntie Patsy, whispering into your ear, real as the statue of Mary in the background. Everything in this moment is true, dear Seven. But even truth is not impervious to time, and we lose so much. Even this day's memories will thin and disappear. But you already sense this, the anticipation already given way to something else you cannot name as you solemnly wait to be captured, bending your smile into the camera's light. This is 14. How the bud yearns to flower, believing that bloom is all beauty perfuming the bliss of pluck, how she knows nothing of uprooting, the constraints of glass, the burden of perpetual brightening. When she blossoms in her dreams, she is only the full rose of herself, free at last from the inconvenient root. How she strains against her greenness, prays for the day a hand will lift her away. O oh, rose, let us not tell her of whither. Let her turn her best face to the sky. The other series that happens in here is a series of music poems, sort of. They're love poems in different keys. I couldn't really tell you why, except that it happened that way. Um, and so that was the, the pr prompt for me that all of these, these musical keys just kept bringing these poems. Um, and so this one is Love in G Major, which I think is a, a fun play after the, the 14 poem about expectation. Love in G Major. Imagine heaven. The clean, unblinking white of loose robes, not much different from the unifying Catholic school pleats we despised as teens, our faces fresh then, layered with adolescence, acne, and angst. Even then we sang in the choir, what a friend we have in Jesus, and yes, it being heaven, I guess Jesus would be there too, and at last we'd see those famous wounds up close, ask what he thought of those tacky photographs of, of his sacred heart with its thorny galland and shouts of yellow light, a crimson star afloat in the uncut cavern of his godly chest, his robe still impossibly white for all the bleeding such a heart might have had to endure. But maybe we wouldn't discuss it, since there'd be no more of that in heaven. 
no more pain, I mean. Rather, the body transfigured, its annoyances abandoned, like moving out of the cramped studio apartment, its broken radiators, moldy walls, cockroaches in the tub, the heart, a bulging bag of trash left outside for the dump truck to haul away, compact, bury. And yes, love would exist, but as an accessory like the halo and fluffy wings and sheet music, it just comes with the gig, not the old monster that stomps through this life, haplessly we, comes through this life, um, devastating us, or the beguiling fairy that charms good sense into sweet, burning madness. No, this Eden is all serpent, no tongue, all tree, no desire for more than the heady kiss of innocence, and we are new again, first peoples, whole amidst the unsullied bounty of the earth, and we are not afraid, we are not afraid. The other thing about this poem, it was a prompt to write one, a one sentence poem. So it's a lot of punctuation to make that happen in here. Um, the next poem I'm about to read is a hard one, but I really wanted to read it here because I wrote it here. And more importantly, I wrote it after uh, being invited by the Went Center to give a talk on creativity and integrity. And so we were reading, I forget the author's name, and um, aligning inside and outside experiences as living with integrity. Um, and you know, I was just thinking about that with regard to creativity and what that means. And I started writing this poem, which is something I'd been trying to write for a very long time. Um, and then I think the Saturday before I read, I did the reading for Went. I sort of coughed up the first draft of this poem, which is quite long. Um, but one of the things that writing it made me realize, and again, I really have to thank Went for that, is um, again, I have a degree in feminist gender and sexuality studies. I'm very much a feminist. I very much engage in that um, sort of outlook on life. I, I live in my body as a female. Um, but I'd never examined some of the impetus behind that. And it was really sort of in writing this poem, I was able to write through and reconcile some of that external, uh, what's the word, activity um, with some internal experience and, and leftover grief. So this is 18. Um, there are two things you probably need to know. One is that, well, there are a couple of, there are a couple of moments where the language isn't mine and I'll do a little wave so you'll know when that happens, I guess. Tonight, you are full of small rivers. Your eyes salty run off, the rust bright trickle staining your thigh, the unnameable, undammed flooding in your chest. You are drowning in all of them. Sweet girl, of course you do not have the words. It will take you almost 10 years to find them. They are both more powerful and less useful than you can believe in this night when your hands and faith have failed you, when your mouth is an absence of screams. Some rivers are wider than any courage. I give you nothing as you sink alone under those waters. This is how I am born. Under those waters you labor to birth me. For days, you are dead to alarms, knocks, rings, and messages with their battery of concern and questions you have no answer for. You have made yourself impenetrable to insistence with sleep's shadowy armor, with a silence that consumes all sound whole. You are beyond the world's reach, which is one kind of safety. I can only imagine that bodiless place, its darkness like a sweetness in the mouth, the secrets you learned there delivered me, your miracle scream, your dark voice. Together we left that realm of smoke, returned to this country of blood, awoke. You wake up, but you can never return. No matter what country you burden with dreams of home, if there are rivers, if blood or tears or time flow there, if memory lives or is buried there, if leaving was your own doing, if you were captured or borrowed or lost, if the doors were cast wide or if you pried them open, if there are doors or doorways, your name is not a key. Return has no means in any language, no lines around it in any map. To go back 
is a verb conjugated in dreams that dissolves on your tongue when you wake up reaching for it. You seek a different debt, choose a different piece, your verb, to forget. And you forgot. You moved through your days easy with a lightness that was not untrue. You lifted weights and danced, you biked and ran, you moved and moved, never still long enough for your shadow to settle. You visited familiar countries, not quite the same as returning, made home the body's wild contours. You wore short skirts and spiky heels. You held bottles to your mouth, sparked fire to your face, learned to suck the smoke in and feel it swirling there next to your heart. You defied sleep, worked a late shift at bars instead of dreaming. You kept your eyes open, your gaze fixed ahead on the slippery horizon. Oh, slippery horizon, seeming fixed just within reach is your most perfect trick. You keep us going by it, hang your dazzle like the perfect carrot. We chomp and chomp towards you. When you're bright enough, we need not look behind. Who wants to reach back when the future beckons, a kept promise? 18, you know everything is at stake, your possible life, hopes of making good you long to realize, some nagging truth, your sanity, pride. It is not a choice, this horizon, but a bearable path. We have faith in the sign saying, this way to happiness, you're closer each day. You believe happiness is the bearable vision of yourself, the woman who lives certain in her skin, the woman who walks unafraid, whose throat out thunders thunder. Each day she unwinds the bright rope of her will, harnesses the hours for her pleasure. Her laughter is an open door, happy her heart empty of longing, happy is her dreamless and unvisited sleep. She's a bullet, a bird, all things swift and light that ride on wind. She will not turn. She will answer to no name but her own. She is entire. She makes herself wide so nothing can hold her. She holds all inside. We hold all 18, but not everything dies because we believe burial and end. Something waits to make gardens of us, to wreath us with quiet thorns. It grows fat and bursts its skin in us, thrives on our rivers, it waits in our dark. It sets down roots, long fingers probing the earth of us. It breaks free and breathes the air of us, it reaches for our light. 18, it creeps along our paths, it thickens, it clings. Inside our bodies, something always waits to disappear, to burn, or to startle us with bloom. It unfolds obscene flowers. A doom of petals litters us, our breath, their fragrance, heavy, bitter. For years, they sent our daily air heavy. Breath after breath, we press on, the story ripening in us, its eyes looking through ours in a mirror. We have not seen our face without its shadow for almost 10 years, and now this. In a class on violence against women, the professor prophesies this moment. It will come for anyone who has suffered trauma. We do not believe we are anyone until we are sobbing for the night the boy you liked held you down and made you bleed. Again, the rivers, but this time I come bearing a word, rape. We cling to the raft of it, begin our escape. In the raft of language, we begin our escape. We hold ourselves tightly inside it, whisper its single syllable like a spell. The word means it was not your fault for liking him, for kissing him, for leaning into the touch he pressed against your shoulders. Despite the desire, despite the first thrill, the word means you said no, and that matters too. The word means you were not being punished by God. The word means you were not weak, not stupid, not damned. You were a victim, not a tease, not a cautionary tale, not a moral. This is what a word can give, definition meaning, the closest we get to salvation. Meaning is the closest we get to salvation, which is to say the word changes nothing. It does not unmake the rivers, cannot erase them from the landscape of us. Spells have their limits, which is to say return means too late to be saved in any language. 
The longing is to be pure. What you get is to be changed. 18, we will carry our dark. We will birth ourselves again and again. We will tend our gardens, harvest the difficult fruit. We will apprentice ourselves to the work and learn the language that will allow us to summon our own angels. We survive. We go on. We cross those rivers. We live. I'm going to read two more poems, and I swear they will not be depressing. Um, 15. 15, I am writing from 29, still 29, I'm writing from 29 to tell you we live. I remember our dreams, the long white hallways with no end, and how we, when we tried to imagine life after high school, it was blank and solid as a grave. We thought that meant there was no future for us, and practice accepting our absence from our own lives. No more best friendships, school dances, no more yearning for boys to whom we were already invisible. Now we are almost twice your age. The face we couldn't envisage is yours, but leaner with shadows of mom in its profile. In two years, we will step on our first plane and fall in love with flight. We will move like wind across the world. We conjugate French class verbs in Paris and Nice. We follow Jesus to Bethlehem and Galilee. We have lived in places you do not yet know exist. I see now that it will all begin with you. The path away from home marked with nothing. Who could walk it but the girl who has already made peace with her own end? 15, looking back, I understand our quiet death weight, the surprise of our persistent daily waking. We never could have imagined this. Dubuque is one of those places I didn't know existed in Trinidad, FYI. Just, just putting it out there. Letter to the outside, I also wrote this at Gentel, and just so you know, there's a dead goat in this poem. I did not kill the goat. The goat was there, and I, uh, I was completely obsessed with this goat. I think it was a goat. Um, it was already sort of much decayed when I came across it, um, and I kept going back there every day I was there to sort of just watch this body disappear. Um, so much so that the photographer, my present, was a picture of said goat, which I have in my house that my sister really does not like. Um, I like it. <laughs> anyway, so I wrote this poem, uh, Letter to the Outside. It is magic here, outside the rule of clocks and scurry. The vast baskets of mountains overflow. The clouds clink like ice in a glass. I drink it all in, and it is enough. What a concept contentment. Yesterday, where the creek tipples at the base of the valley, I saw a dead goat, stiff, ringed with flies, its face like a plate of leftovers. I wept, then I did not. I stood at the roadside until the wind wafted up its benediction. From this place, I gift you the unoccupied air, the wobbly prancing of new calves, a sky so close the stars might be a chain link fence you run your hands along as you amble through the night, your live and mutable body, its spark and spell and solitude, right back. Thank you. Be because I am a cheese ball, I have concocted difficult fruit punch, which is available in the back, along with fruit, because it's called, the, you know that, right? Okay. Please enjoy. <laughs> Thank you.